And what we really focus on is what makes, what, what's universal about being a business owner. That we, um, no matter what industry we're in, we're wrestling with the same issues. Finding good people, getting investors, getting customers, making payroll, all those kinds of things. And what we do uh, in EO is we get together and we talk about those issues, the things that business owners are wrestling with, and we share experiences. So we're really good at sharing our failures as well as our successes. Most of the time in life, you're all talking about how great everything is. Um, we get together in the room, close the door, and uh, talk about how we screwed it up. Uh, because you can learn as much or more from someone about that, uh, talking about that than you can talking about how great things have been. So um, we're excited to be a part of, of the conference here. When I talked to Chris, I said, you know, I think what we could do, since we're really about the universal aspects of being a business owner, is bring in something that uh, we all wrestle with no matter what industry you're in. And that is, if you're passionate about something, are you selling out when you make money doing it, right? Is there some trade-off between passion and profit? You're forced to make money or make good art, make great art. So um, I put together a panel of some of our EO members here from Columbus that have businesses that are artistic in some nature, and uh, we're going to talk about those kind of issues today and just share, you, share with you what we've been through, and uh, hopefully you can take some things away from it. So let me introduce our, my, this is like, a, like an Avengers panel. Like you guys all have like superhero. Uh, I here. would like a superhero name, please. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> by the time we got to end, we got to come up with a Kristen, a new super name, superhero name for Kristen. All right. So, Alberto Scirocco, down at the end, originally, Alberto's from Milan, Italy. Um, he's the founder uh, and chief creative director at Left Channel. And he deb debuted his first exhibition at the famed, you're going to have to say it. Trenale. Exactly. Trenale. In Milan at age 17. So, as an artist, he's got the chops. Uh, Eventually, he moved a few years later to Columbus and went to CCAD, and I think you're still involved there a lot today, right, teaching? On occasion, yeah. Yeah. Um, Alberto's company, Left Channel, was founded in 2003, and uh, his signature style, their signature style, is ever-present on, some of, ever -present on uh, some of the most recent projects, including two promos for E, uh, Fashion Week New York, animation for a vibrant new open Discovery Channel Rise and Psy, and character animation for University of Colorado Health and Welfare Plan Initiative entitled Brussels and Muscles. <laughs> Left Channel is also a 2014 South by Southwest Excellence in Title Design finalist. So Alberta is going to be part of our panel today. Kristen Harris, still trying to come up with a superhero name for her. All right. <laughs> 13 years as a designer, art director, and creative manager for corporate marketing departments gave her the idea, an eye for talent, and a passion for working with creative people. And after years of wishing there was a better way to connect with creative people for projects or positions, she co-founded Portfolio Creative in 2005. Portfolio Creative places temp, temp to hire, direct to hire, and contractors into advertising and marketing roles uh, for client needs. Kristen also is a big supporter of creative, uh, creative and business communities through work with the Columbus Society of Communication Arts, CCAD as well, and then EO Columbus. Brad Griffith started writing code in his teens. He's our coder, right? That's our superpower there. And spent his early teens, uh, spent his early years developing in-house applications for companies like J.P. Morgan Chase and Qualcomm. He started Buckeye Interactive in 2009, now has a team of about 16 people creating custom solutions for tech startups, libraries, local and county governments, among others. He earned his MBA after completing his bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering with honors at The Ohio State University. And uh, Brad's incredibly passionate probably even more than a lot of us uh, in the EO, about how entrepreneurship and innovation can drive meaningful change in a community. So he's constantly looking for ways to be a part of, of that as well. And last but not least, J.L. Holdsworth. We mm -hmm. always start by saying he's a world champion power lifter. <laughs> Published author, world champion power, just stop there, right? Published author, successful entrepreneur, with best lifts of 905 pound squat, 775 bench press and 804 pound deadlift. JL is no doubt one of the strongest and most experienced strength and conditioning coaches in the industry. He regularly consults, regularly consults with major collegiate NFL and NHL programs such as the New York Jets, St. Louis Blues, University of Clemson, and the Ohio State University. In 2010, he founded the Spot Athletics with two locations, 20,000 20, square feet in Columbus, Ohio for training people. And he's also the co-founder of Reflexive Performance Reset RPR, an injury prevention and performance system being used by many top sports organizations around the world. So that's our panel today. So uh, we want to talk about passion versus profit and whether you have, whether there's a trade-off there.
Are you not introducing yourself? Oh. So, well, I'm the ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill <laughs> Troy. Yeah. So uh, I've been at EO for 17 years. Um, I was the past president, a president of our chapter last year. I have two companies. I have a market research company I founded in 1997 on the internet, when the internet was a new thing and people didn't even know you could do stuff online. So we were pioneers in that 22 years ago. Still have that company. We do a lot of work for entertainment media clients today. So we do work for record companies and movie studios and people like that to help Taylor Swift figure out which song off the album is gonna be a hit and should be played on the radio more. Um, and we also have a marketing company that focuses on human relationship as a process in sales and marketing and helping people make real human connections by uh, sort of deconstructing what a relationship is and how it forms and how it, how it functions because a lot of people don't know that these days. So that's, that's my business. All right, so when I sent a note out to these guys about this panel um, and said, uh, I'm putting this panel together, passion versus profit, Alberto wrote back like in two seconds. I don't know if my message had time to get to you before yours got back to me. He says, I could go on for hours about this. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, I have a question for each of them. We'll kind of start with each person uh, on the question dedicated to them. We'll let everybody else kind of fill in as well. Uh, but let's just start with that basic question, passion versus profit. Do you, is there a trade-off? Do you have to choose making money over uh, making great art? And so you don't have hours, but you have minutes, Alberto. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, that is kind of a topic of interest for me in, in general, uh, just because I think you get in, uh, you know, I think most, are, I mean, how many people here are actually are artists? Okay, so it's a pretty good component. So uh, a good percentage of you guys are artists. So you go into art because you're passionate about art, and that's basically it. You focus, you're very clear focus, and that's on the work itself. And most artists are going to be motivated by the work itself. And then you have to do something with it. So then you either become an independent or you start a business. But somewhere in, at some point, you have to introduce the element of commerce in it. Um, and I think that becomes a little bit of a, uh, of a frightening transition for most creatives uh, because you start, you know, that's the part that you are less comfortable with. Um, have a conversation about money, figuring out, you know, the profit part of it in general. And, and you go out there and right now, especially this, the, the internet is full of all these gurus that teach people how to, you know, forget being an artist and actually turn into an entrepreneur, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Like just f fully transition from one to the other. Um, so... Yeah, I yeah, I really can't go on for hours, so I'm gonna try to, to get, get short on this because this is like it's been a big topic of a lot of um, uh, of other talks I've done. But you know, there's obviously lots of ways that you can make money as an artist, uh, s being service, being on one side, and the other thing, product, being on the other side. And by, my, by product, what I mean is if you can do the thing that you're passionate about and you're good at, and that you can be true to it, and it stays exactly the way it is, and people want it without having to modify it, that is a great space to be. Um, most of the other times, you're gonna do some kind of service. So you're gonna basically use your artistic ability uh, to perform tasks for commerce. And you know that has to take a certain type of mentality, but um, you have to be passionate about that result, about that process, right? And so if you can do that and get excited about you know, uh, the solve and all the other aspects of it, um, that is also a way that you can I guess, thrive. Um, you know, I got into this field very artistically. I mean, I was a fine artist. I was a graffiti artist as a kid. Uh, that's how I got brought into that, um, that company, you know, that, um, the show. And uh, so for me, it's always been about the work. And even today, you know, even running a business for 20 years, I still make some decisions that are very much driven by the work itself. It's a very conscious decision, which obviously puts me sometimes at a disadvantage in terms of running in the business, because I am aware that there's more successful business routes that would have to, you know, that would force me to not do all the things that I like to do with the work. So it's, a, it's an odd thing to have conversation, especially when you deal with other business owners. They kind of look at you weird when you tell them that. And, and they're right, because it is weird. You just do through all the work of operating something, and you're going to stop short of what is logically the goal of it, which is a profit, because you're really trying to make something that you think uh, is good in itself, which is, a, which is an odd thing. Um, but I think, honestly, the biggest thing is, especially, you know, walking around here, I see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, especially independent gaming companies, I feel like you have to take this step at the beginning and just kind of define really what it is you're going for. 
right? Are you thinking, I really want to start a business because I want it to be a successful business. I'm going to use my skills uh, to make that business successful. And so you're taking it down a certain path and you got to make decisions that are true to that. Um, and uh, if you take the other path and you say, well, I want to make really amazing work and I'm going to do everything I can to support it financially, um, you know, you could get lucky. Like I said, you could just happen to make that one thing that everybody wants and you do nothing smart about it. Uh, and it works out very well for you. But um, I just think that being true to yourself at the beginning is, is very important. Otherwise, all these people, uh, they're out there, they try to teach you how to be a better thing that you're not. They end up basically preying on your insecurity, right? They end up basically figuring out, like, well, you're going to be nervous about selling, so I'm going to teach you how to sell. And then you're going to put all your energy into that, and it's really not what you were in it for. And that's where the s stress comes, right? If you just, the moment that you decided to do a thing, but then you find yourself putting 100% of your energy to do something that is antithetical to that. That's when you're suffering. Um, so as much as you can, you know, early on, I guess, plot a path of, you know, here's my ideal state. You know, I'm going to be happy with this space uh, and then start building in that direction. I think it's a more functional way to approach. I'm going to copy it this because literally I will just talk forever. This is like around a afterwards for topic. several hours. <laughs> it's a very, very, very passionate topic for me. Anyway. Any thoughts from you, get, you guys about this topic? Just generally just, the topic. I mean, briefly on the, the idea of doing something you don't really love. Um, you know, I had a, an employee one time who said to me, I, I really, my biggest fear is letting people down. I don't want to let our team down. And I'm being asked to, I'm sorry, I can't see everyone there. Um, I'm asked to, to do things in my job that I'm, I'm not great at, but I want to do it because that's what I'm being asked to do. And on one hand, I want to say, yes, if you're asked to do something, you, I really need you to do it. But on the other hand, the easiest way, what I told him, and I felt like it was this you know, movie uh, climax moment, <laughs> the easiest way to let people down is to be someone who you're not. And I, like, I didn't want to be all cheesy about it. But that's, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, like if, uh, if you're asked to do something that's slightly outside of your uh, comfort zone, okay, but if you're consistently trying to fill a role in your job that's not what you love, you're not going to be as good at it as if you do what you really love. So I, I think even most employers would want you to choose some roles and choose responsibilities that you're going to be very passionate about. Yeah, I think, so I went to art school too, and there's always all this conversation about like selling out. I think you use that term too, selling out. And I think it makes it seem like selling or being paid for your work is a bad thing. And to me, I think especially now, like creativity and ideas and fresh thoughts and, and thinking, you know, differently is so valuable. Like, that's the thing that makes businesses different right now. You know, we can all access the internet and build a website for ourselves or whatever, but it's the ideas and the thinking that is going to set one business apart or, you know, one piece or game or whatever is the, the freshness, the freshness and the ideas of it. And so being paid for that, like being paid for being good at that is not shameful. <laughs> it's good. And I think it is very hard a lot of times for artists to, to get to that point. It's almost like, um, I do this work, but then over here I do the stuff I really care about. And if you can figure out how to show people the things you really care about and have them pay you to do that. To me, that's, that's the beautiful place to be. And at times it's okay to do something that you need to to get paid yeah. so that you can also do your Everybody art. has so a side hustle, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, or three. I mean, everyone yeah. I know has two or three different separate little things going on. But maybe some of those will turn into something bigger for them. Absolutely. Well, I think one of the things <laughs> that I think is funny, right, is that if you do something and no one's willing to pay you for it, you're probably not that good at it, right? Like that's how we value things in our society, right? And so I think one of the things with this whole discussion that I talk to, I, I do strength and conditioning, so I talk to a lot of people who wanna be coaches and they see, for, for my field, they see these guys on TV working with professional athletes and all these things, I wanna do this. I'm so passionate about this, I love working out. and whether it's art or working out, everyone starts out saying they're passionate, but my philosophy on, on being passionate about something is you can't truly be passionate or know you're passionate about something till you've been in it for a long time, right? Doing something for a week, oh, you know, I had a friend, I wanna be a professional gamer. He was on unemployment, he had like a year of unemployment, and he's like, I'm gonna be a professional gamer at the end of the year, and at the end of the year, he was no better at gaming, he just wasted a year, and so, 
these things people say I'm passionate about, really, they're just excited and it's a weekend. So for me, I've, I've been in fitness and, and strength conditioning for over 20 years now. I can say I'm really passionate about it. I've been doing it for 20 years and it's all I do. It's my business. It's my life and I love it. Uh, I think that's one thing too, when you guys are looking at some of this stuff, make sure that when we talk about passion, you know, differentiate between I'm excited about something new and I'm truly passionate about something and worth going the mile. I can tell you when I moved to Columbus, Ohio to power lift professionally. And, uh, when I moved here, I, I moved here because I, I really want to be the best in the world. I want to be a world champion. And there's a gym here in Columbus that is invite only. Uh, if you guys have Netflix, you can watch a documentary on it. It's called West Side vs. World. Uh, and so when I moved here, I had $300 to my name. I had everything I owned in a two-door Grand Dam, and I lived on someone's couch. And that's what I did to get here. And that's what it took for me to be the best in the world was to do that and to sacrifice everything to be the best in the world. That's passion. That's going all in. Very few people in the world know what that is. And I think people throw that term passion around a lot when it's just, I'm excited about something new. So my advice is make sure that, that you understand the long-term commitment that passion really entails. You know, that's one of the things that we even see um, as entrepreneurs, I think that's a universal thread for entrepreneurs is that I don't have another choice. <laughs> I, I'm not doing anything else. This is me. It's what I'm going to do. And I think or that's, I'm unemployable. Well, I that's, yeah, we always joke. All <laughs> no of us are unemployable. No one will hire me anymore. I have no too many opinions. No one would put up with me, right? <laughs> so I think, it's, I think that's what you're talking about is something that you can't not do, right? If you can mm -hmm. get talked out of it, if you can be dissuaded from it, then maybe you're not passionate enough about it. Yeah, I mean, I, also, part of it is also not, not the what in terms of like what the general thing it is that you do, right? But the what specifically. I think in, in our school, when people talk about selling out, they're not talking about, uh, they're talking about which kind of work you do, right? right. Not doing the work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're a musician and, you know, mo most popular music is built on three chords, right? And, and to a musician, to a real musician, that music is boring. Uh, when you get in, into something and you understand that medium really well, you start becoming elitist, right? The things that are popular, they're less interesting to you. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part where it gets tricky. Mm -hmm. If you want to do work that more people will buy, and get paid, right? You have to do work that's popular. Um, but then, personally, you might really, really appreciate the work that's elitist, and that's where the split <laughs> starts happening, right? So, you know, I can do work that is, that is popular, but I'm passionate about the work that's elitist. So, at some degree, that's, that's where you start balancing out things. I think when you get into gaming, maybe it gets a little bit less, less defined, right? Because I think, because uh, gamers are kind of all elitist, at some degree, and so, <laughs> Uh, it seems like one unique field where the really good stuff actually really rises to the top versus mm -hmm. having like the big split, like yeah, getting music, for example. Uh, so maybe it's fairly unique in that case. That you, can, you really can drive for the highest quality. So, um, you know, a business is, a, is an entity and you are a person and you may not be the same, right? Um, a lot of times your business starts as you, but in the, event, in the end it becomes its own living, breathing thing. And, I want to mention, ask you, Brad, because I know you've done this recently and have everybody kind of comment on this. One of the things people fear about going into business is all the stuff you hate. Like, I don't want to hire people. I don't want to fire people for sure. Oh, payroll, uh, investors. I just want to do my thing. You reach a point in business where you realize uh, that you, you can get to a point where you can just do your thing and you get other people. One of the secrets of being a business owner is finding other people to do all the things you hate, basically, uh, because they're all into that, thank God. <laughs> Somebody wants to do everything you hate. You just gotta find them and get them excited about that thing you hate and oh, yeah. that's great. And I know you've recently kind of worked through that in your company, getting to the point where you can just do what you love and what you're passionate about inside your company, right? Yeah, we're working on it. It's not, yeah, not. <laughs> you're, you've got it all solved. All solved, it's all, yeah, yeah. I'll figure I'll it out. But talk about that process sure. as well, so you can follow your own personal passion within a company that does other things. Absolutely, yeah. So there, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a constant, uh, constant growth struggle. So you're, you know, I'm at 16 employees right now with my software engineering firm and, um, you know, I, when I started it, I thought, oh, you know, maybe one day I'll have two, three employees. And you know, I got my first employee. I'm like, well, I could see getting to five employees. <laughs> got to five. You know, we really need, I need about 10. And when we're at 10, you know, we're going to have all the skill sets covered. And you get there. And so it just, it snowballs. Um, we're at 16 now. There's one role that I really need to fill. I'm always going to say this. There's <laughs> just one next role. Um, but there's, you know, I do business development for our team. So I'm selling our work. I'm talking with clients. 
It's a lot of strategy, figuring out what does a, a business or organization need to grow? What are the, the struggles that are holding them back? And um, how can we uniquely apply technology and design to help them grow? And so I'm doing that business development work. But I know that to run a business, um, you know, most of you, if you feel really strongly about your, your art or your craft, how many of you say that like, you're a specialist, you love the kind of work that you do, and that's why you might want to run a business? You would say it's because of the type of work that I want to do that as a business. How many, what, uh, what are some reasons that all of you want to run a business someday? Or how many of you actually want to run a business? Some of you might just want to do your art. Why do you want to run a business? Anyone? Shout it out. Oh, yeah, he's behind the pony and brain. Yeah, so maybe it's creative control a little bit. Mm -hmm. You want some power, you want to do what you want to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, same as him, I want to do what, like, what I want to make. But, yeah. Um, I also just want economic freedom. Economic mm -hmm. freedom. And not to be beholden to like, one, specific, one specific path. Yeah, OK. Maybe you'll define your path one more. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, be your own boss, basically. Be your own boss. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so some good, good reasons. Um, so wanting creative control, absolutely. When you run the show, if you're paying the bills, uh, if you pay the bills, you get to decide how things are done. Um, but it, it, there's, there's a point when you say, you know, I want to control my destiny. I want to control my work. When you start a business and you want to grow it beyond just being, you know, there are lots of businesses that are a one or two person business. Uh, and you have a lot of control over what you do and how you do it mm -hmm. as a contractor. When you start hiring more people and getting more employees, on one hand, I found that um, I was no longer able to just be a great developer. It was not enough to write great code. I now had other people with different motivations and different needs. And my job has become now, with 16 employees, my job has become I need to make sure that everyone has what they need to be successful. It's no longer about me writing code. <laughs> the team hates it when I write code. Uh, I get in when, when necessary. We launched a, uh, we got a really big app that's launching on Monday. The team was busy on that. So I was helping out with some of the support work. They don't really like it when I do that because now I have people who are better at doing all of the things in my business than I am. And so when you can get to a point where you can say, you know what, my, my core skill set, I'm no longer the best one at this. I can hire someone who's going to be even better than me, and I can then move on to the next thing. And that's really how I've approached it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've never been a designer, so we needed a designer on staff. We hired one of those, uh, hired a developer, so now I can start doing other things. And we add more and more people. Uh, like Bill said, when we identify a skill set that uh, either I don't want to do, you know, it's the, uh, who wants to answer the phones? Who wants to schedule meetings? Well, we've got someone who absolutely loves being that support system for the team. And what she gets her, her fulfillment out of is being the person that everyone turns to to do the things they don't want to do so that they can focus on their work. And so someone's passionate about that. Great. You know, a lot of people say, I don't want to sell. But salespeople, has anyone met a salesperson who's really passionate about sales? You don't want to be around that person frequently. But, you know, it's something that a lot of people don't want to do. So I, what I've found is that I've tried to find those, uh, those people and hire them who are passionate about that work, who can do a great job at it. So what I, what I might suggest, um, and there have been times in my life where I've said, you know what, I want to be a great developer. I went to work for J.P. Morgan Chase. I just wanted to learn to be a better developer, and I could just do that. You know, I went in. I, I, I uh, had always said going through school, I don't want to be the kind of developer who sits behind a desk and writes code for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Um, at Chase, that is exactly what I did. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, writing code. And I loved it. It was fantastic. <laughs> so I, I didn't know until I got there that I could do that. So if you really find something that you want to do and you want to keep doing that, maybe running a business and growing that business is not the best approach. Maybe you start off just consulting or even find a job for someone. You know what I would like to do with my employees, I like them to have a lot of flexibility uh, so that they can pursue their passion, as long as it's not in conflict with what they're doing at work. Pursue their passion. If they're doing the thing that they love and that's valuable to our company, great. If they also, you know, I had an employee who took all of last week off to get, he got paid a little bit, got a stipend to practice a game that just launched. Don't ask me which game. Game that just launched, and then he participated in a tournament on Saturday. And so that's how he spent his week, his vacation time. Uh, so I want my team to be able to do that. And maybe for some of you, that's the way. You know, if you want to do something, create a podcast, 
be a professional gamer. You find a job that pays the bills, that gives you flexibility so that you can, and you do something for an employer that they don't want to do or that you're better at than they are, and then you pursue your passion as well. So that's, that's the approach that I've taken anyway, to making sure that everything is covered in the business. I don't have to be the one doing anything that I don't want to do or I'm not good at, but it's taken some time to get there. And you know, we hired a business development person, didn't work out, I'm now back in that seat. So it's not a foolproof system, but we're working <laughs> on it. I think the thing too is to know what, what really your specific personal passion is, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be, you know, gaming, that's such a big thing, right? Is it specifically mm -hmm. coding? Is it specifically types of code? It's, I mean, yeah. you can get down to very specific things. And as long as you keep that in your mind, you know what your compass is. You'll know when you're off track. You know when you, what you got to get back to. And I think that's the key is just kind of making sure you know what your personal passion is. You know, as entrepreneurs, we're focusing on ourselves. Our businesses are... I like to say that our businesses are a symptom of what's wrong with us psych psychologically, but a business is an expression of what you're trying to accomplish in the world. And in fact, all three of you said something that's a 100% common theme with business owners, which is all of you said you wanted to have a business because you wanted control. Mm -hmm. Nobody said money. Mm -hmm. Control is the number one reason entrepreneurs have a business. They want to control the universe. They want to create the world that they want to live in. And whatever that is, just the clearer you can be about what that is, the more likely it's going to happen. So. I had a mentor who asked me, do you want control, Brad, or do you want money? Yeah. <laughs> you got you to gotta pick. Yeah. Like yeah. You can either be fully in control or you can make a lot of money. You can't always have both. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> let's, so Kristen, let's talk about that idea of knowing what you're about and, and finding the right spot and doing other things. So you're obviously in the business of sort of placing people in lots of creative roles. You're also a big proponent of mentors. You've been, been part of the mentorship program globally yeah. in EO uh, all around the world for us as an organization. So talk about getting guidance from other people who've been down the path before you. Yeah, I think um, having mentors is, is so important. And I think it's um, interesting. So yes, I've been involved in EO's mentorship program, which is very formal and structured, and it's a one-year thing, and you're meshed up with somebody. but. To me, there's so many ways to have and find mentors. It could be through a program like that or um, you know, an industry group or whatever that has some sort of formal program that connects you with someone. But I have mentors that I've just you know found through whatever, running into them at an event or whatever. And I have mentors that don't actually know they're my mentor. So, you know, surprise for them. Um, but, you know, there's like certain people I always seek out. If I'm at an event and they're there, I'm like, ooh, I'm going to go sit with that person and talk to them because they're very interesting and I always learn something. Or sometimes it's somebody you don't really know. You know, I've, I have certain podcasts I always listen to and, and things like that. And so to me, some of those people are kind of mentors too. They don't know it, but they're you know, um, answering questions and impacting my life and, and helping me learn things. So I think that a mentor, some, sometimes it just sounds like this big title, um, but to me it's just somebody who knows something I don't. And it could be they know something about one specific thing that I need to learn, you know, I'm trying to get better at sales or something, maybe I would seek out somebody who's really great at that. Or sometimes they just have a lot more life experience than I do. A lot of my mentors through EO are considerably older and more mature than me. And they've just been down the you know paths of life a lot more times than I have. And they have seen and experienced a, a lot more things than, than I have so far. So I think that... Um, Sometimes people get so hung up on that word, you know, it's so daunting, like, I need to find a mentor, and that seems very overwhelming to do, or someone asked me to be their mentor, and like, I don't, you know, I'm not qualified for that. Um, so I just always encourage people to just think about it more like, who is out there that maybe knows something you don't, and that you can reach out to, maybe in real life, or, you know, online, like, we can, it's so great, because we can connect with people I have, you know, through this EO mentorship we have people all over the world. I can connect with somebody in India and ask them questions. That's amazing to me. So there are so many ways to connect with people. Um, and most people are very, I have found, no guarantees, but I have found most people are very open and friendly and helpful. That's one thing. And I don't know if it's a Columbus thing or if it's, you know, an entrepreneur thing or whatever, but Rarely do people say, no, I won't spend time with you. I mean, generally, it's like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll talk to you on the phone, or I have 15 minutes, or we'll have coffee, or whatever. Um, and so, like, what's the worst thing they do? They'll ignore you. Like, you can move on. It won't kill you. If, you know, usually if you reach out, they won't say no. They'll just never respond, which is fine. 
Um, but I, yeah, I just would encourage you, no matter what you're trying to do, if you are building your craft, you know, developing your art, your skills, your business savvy, whatever it is, just seek out people who have done it before and you can just learn from them. You don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. That's one of the universal things we find in EO is that there are probably like 10 questions we're all wrestling with, right? Yeah. I mean, it just- They're the same 10. No, same thing. And the same thing every <laughs> entrepreneur has wrestled with before mm -hmm. and they will again. Yeah. And so that's the great part is, is this question, passion versus profit is something that could have had a panel on last year and last year and last year and 20 years ago. It was the same question artists were wrestling with then and will be. So mm -hmm. there are people that have wrestled with this throughout their life that have become successful and you can reach out to them and they can talk about how they work through it. Um, I know you probably would say the word coach instead of mentor, but I, mean, I know people have helped you work through things, right? Well, <clears throat> well, what I always like to say, everybody in this room is trying to do something that someone else has already done. And the thing, one of my favorite sayings is a smart person learns from their mistakes. A really smart person learns from other people's mistakes. And you'll get ahead so much faster in life. And that was part of what I talked about moving to Columbus, Ohio to be a world champion. That gym had a lot of people that were world champions. So if I wanted to do that, go be around other people who have done that. And it got me there a lot quicker and it was able to make a lot less mistakes. And that's one thing, regardless of whatever you're trying to do in life, just seek out people who've done it. And honestly, like Chris, since most people are pretty giving of their time and their knowledge because I think as a whole, most people in the world want to see everyone in the world do better. Because if every one of you does better, like everyone up here does better. Like, mm -hmm. look at the people next to you. If they do better, we all do better as a society. And I think most people want that for our world in general. And if they don't, they're a dick. So it doesn't matter if they get back to you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so. Alberto, you're kind of probably been mentored, but you're also playing the mentor role for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and I, it's interesting because I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, uh, you know, there, there's this idea of being in the place of most potential, you know, um, that obviously as an artist, it's easy enough to just go hide yourself into a box and just do the thing, whatever it is, right? You can just do the little, 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 draw, 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 paint, 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 or whatever it is, it is you do and do it endlessly, and and you definitely learn something from it. You learn something because you spend so much time in your own head and you learn a little bit about yourself, which is a fundamental aspect of being an artist. Uh, and you gain the technical skills by just massive repetition. But you don't grow as a person unless you get out and unless you force yourself to interact with some people. Um, and, and yeah, you talked about you know, coaching and mentorship. And it doesn't have to be this very formal thing. Sometimes there's just you know, single things that somebody says uh, that can be very effective. You just be a, you have to be around them and you, and you have to be listening. I think that's probably one of the hardest uh, things to do. Uh, and that's what I mean by listening is actually keep in mind that everything everybody says in any situation could have uh, a little, little nugget of value that can really change your life. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting stuff. I mean, and I can kind of map through my life these moments where Somebody just maybe put in passing a comment, and then later I thought about it, thought about it, and it literally affected me a little bit. So mm -hmm. for me, a couple of years ago, um, you know, it became, it became very aware of the fact that I've been running a business for as many years as I had. I just kind of got myself into a very isolated state, and so I kind of forced myself to go deal uh, with other people. And it's hard to have peers <laughs> when you're running a business. So then I figured out, well, I got to go meet my competitors, which is busy, that's what happened. So I started busy, mm -hmm. I became friends with the people that I just was competing with every day, which was uncomfortable. Um, but it was an extreme growth uh, for me. I and mean, it was an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. And some of them were total assholes. Um, <laughs> and some of them were amazing people, but, but even like all of them, a some degree had something that was really, really uh, inspiring. So community, uh, and, and I don't mean like the general sense of community, I mean just this like one-to-one -one connection that you can make with people. Uh, it's it's really it's an extraordinarily important thing uh, I think for artists uh, above all others. I mean, most artists kind of go through this weird phase of you're in high school, you're weird, and but you have <laughs> hardly any friends, and and then you're just in this weird space, and then you go to art school, and holy shit, there's all these other artists, and now you're part of a community, and then you get out, and now you're isolated again mm -hmm. because now you're competing with all those people, and then and you have a difficult time even interacting with them, and so it's just a really weird thing for like four years of your life, you're part of a real community, and then you never again have it um, and unless you really make an effort, right? Make an effort, like things like this, right? Ways to be around people and, and exchange ideas. 
uh, something that really, us, even outside really the world of art, could benefit all of us. Um, just it's always, always something that is only going to come by putting yourself in a place of most potential. You have to make that effort consciously. You have to really force yourself to do it because naturally you're not going to want to do it. Great. Um, I want to ask you a question, starting with UJL, about, um, and I was going to joke that I was going to give the, the big guy the question about love. But um, you in particular, but I know you, Alberto, as well, focused on a, a, an endeavor that was really personal, really private. I mean, in your case, it's specifically your own body, right? Mm -hmm. And now you've transitioned to where you're actually trying to change the entire world through something like RPR, right? Almost literally. How does that transition happen where you're so passionate about something that's in some ways really close and narrow and, and intimate and then transition to something larger? How does that all fit in your mind? Yeah, I think that the one thing is that uh, it, it just comes down to your mission. And this is something that if you guys haven't spent time on this, I would really suggest that you do is, is having a personal mission in life. And in, in business, I look at our mission statement as our North Star. If you don't have a North Star for your life, life's going to get pretty rough. And so for me, doing a personal mission statement, understanding what that's about and what you're trying to do there, that can help guide all the decisions you make. So if you don't have that North Star, is it right or is it wrong? I have no compass to know. And so for me, one of the things that's just been something since I was very young is, is I've been very, very passionate about helping other people. And so I've trained with guys who won world championships and they just cared about themselves and they just wanted it for themselves. And that's awesome. That just was never me. That was never part of my mission in life. And so for me, I looked at what I did and, and look, I've made a ton of mistakes. In 2004, I was squatting 1100 pounds, hernia at L5S1, took me from the strongest guy in the world to my roommate was putting my underwear on the next morning, right? So it's a huge thing and I've gone through a, a lot of struggles and for me at this point in my life, it's okay, how do I help other people in the world not go through some of the things I've gone through? And so to me, the, the means or the, you know, my, my landscape that I know how to do that is through physical fitness and mental health and the things we do with the different businesses that I have and the things we teach. And, you know, for me, it's, it's extremely rewarding because it fulfills what my mission in life is. And I think, you know, as you guys are looking at these things and, and what business and what this, the, the number one thing I always tell everybody is that everything starts with you. And so if you don't have the things in your own life taken care of, going out and starting a business, now you're trying to impact other people. Well, if your stuff is not taken care of and locked down, you're not going to be able to impact other people at a high level. And so I really suggest that, that everyone does, regardless if you want to start a business or whatever you do, really work on that personal mission statement because that's going to help develop that North Star and, and help you understand where you really want to go. And it can change. Guys, it can change. I'll tell you, I own two, two gyms 10 years ago. I'd have told you I never want to own one, right? <laughs> so it's just it, that stuff can change all the time. Like Bill said, I, I teach a system. It's called Reflexive Performance Reset. We teach all around the world now. That, that's become a new passion. Right. And so those things change, but, but the North star never does, which is just helping people to get to a much better place and physically and mentally. You know, it's interesting. I'm picturing, you know, in the gym, two of you guys powerlifting right there next to each other, but the North star for each of you is completely different and you can't tell from the outside, right? Only the inside in your heart, you know where you're going and they know where they're going. And that's, what's important for all these people. You may look like the same person next to you, doing the same thing, but you're not going to the same place. Yeah, and, and I think two guys, that's one thing, you know, two people could, you guys can have a conversation. You both love the same things. You both want to do the same things, but why you want to do those things is completely different. And so one of the things that I'll say, and I know you guys are meeting a lot of people this weekend and it's people who are interested in similar things and do similar things. The other thing I'll say guys is, is never compare yourself to anybody else. Don't look at other people's successes. Don't look at what other people have done because everybody's walking their own journey and all of that stuff comes in their own time. And if you just stick true to that mission, to that North Star, you'll get where you're going eventually. And just, you, you really can never, it's one of the biggest lessons I've, I've learned is, is if you just focus on yourself, like the universe takes care of the rest, man. You just gotta focus on yourself. You guys have all the talent and potential in the world. If you just focus on, making that better every day, then, then you'll do great things in life. 
Do you guys feel that pressure? Do you feel the pressure? Do you look at other people and do you feel like the world is full of extraordinarily talented people and you just can't measure up? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone feels that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's just a, like social platform, especially like uh, uh, art aggregators, you know, like mm -hmm. Pinterest and, you know, Behance. Mm -hmm. They're brilliant at making that effect on you, right? Like crushing mm -hmm. your dreams. Like they give you this impression <laughs> that people are there. You see this work that is gorgeous and you're thinking like, oh my God, these people get to do this amazing work. And they have and perfect lives. Yeah, and it, exactly. And it's all, it's all crap. None of it is true. Uh, the great. work is beautiful, but, but most of that work is not for anybody, right? It's just, it's just art. It's just put together to look pretty and to give an impression as people can design and provide it. You know, it's, this is really amazing stuff out there. But it's not relevant, and most importantly, you see a concentration of it, right? You just basically look at this one place, and you see all of it together, and it looks like everybody else can do that but you, <laughs> um, and and it's not true. And it's it's true. It's toxic to some degree. Um, it, it, that stuff is really can be really, really, really bad for you to some degree. But but again, I think if you can able to look at other people's work and just kind of take to the kind of Zen approach of, you know. Of, it's great that there's work out there, but I'm here. You know, just create this separation, and just like get inspiration from it and move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't believe this thing that there's this like little echelon where ever, you know, there's all these people that do amazing work and you just can't get there. So most of those, you know, most of the stuff you see out there, it's, it's, it's very well designed and filtered to give you that impression. People are getting really good at creating the impression of success. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's I mean it's amazing because it's just we model from each other right like every, mm -hmm. there's so many good models things that you can copy say if I just say all these things I sound like I'm really really smart um, <laughs> and and people do it all the time uh, it's uh, it's it's frustrating yeah. it's also impressive when you say something and then you see it on other people's yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Plus. another part of that too is like it's not a zero sum game it's not like there's only so many slots and you know there's ten slots and nine are already taken it's like especially in art and creativity and, and creating things, building things, developing a new game, whatever it is. It's not like there's only so many that can ever be made and you know, 99 of the 100 are already done. It's like, it, it's endless. That's the, the creativity doesn't have any limit or end. So just because you know, all those people are doing great work, that's awesome. You can too, you know? There's a space for everybody. Yeah, and you never, you're never really going to see your own work objectively. That's the other problem. Oh, of course not. Uh, and so, and so, yeah. So then, the thing that you like the most is the thing that you don't know the least. So it's, a, you know, it's external work. It's always going to be very impressive to you. Uh, somebody thinks your work's great. So there's some bit of an ecosystem mm -hmm. there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd say it's a you know a tough balance between having confidence. I remember when I started my business, I wanted to look bigger than we were because it was just me in my home office. So yes. you, you try and look a little bit bigger than you are. Now I feel like it's very important to have humility. And to, when you think about even just platforms like Facebook, and I see what my wife posts, and, and we say, you know what, we live in New Albany. Everyone in New Albany has a perfect life. There's white fences, <laughs> they, you know, beautiful homes. Uh, a lot of lives in New Albany are a mess, just like lives everywhere. And so figuring out in your work, how do you make sure that, how, in your work, how do you make sure that when you are, um, when you're comparing yourself to others, and then you, you go to post something that you're proud of, that you're not doing the same thing. You're not saying, you know what? My business is perfect. And I don't know about you guys. You probably all have problems in your businesses. Mine runs perfectly. <laughs> Everything along. You don't do that. You've got to have some vulnerability about it and be honest about how things are going. So I'd encourage you all to not contribute to other people's imposter syndrome. Don't pretend that everything's perfect. Have confidence and know that you're following your North Star, but don't, um, yeah, don't make other people feel worse about themselves. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that uh, I think is kind of a universal theme throughout EO, and, and especially with these guys on this panel, no matter what industry you're in, um, being a business owner, and, and, and in some ways being an artist too, it's about what's here, right? You've mm -hmm. got to be true to that. And you can pretend, you can fake it, whatever, but in the end, this is what's going to matter, and this is what's going to be consistent and going to stick, no matter whether you change industries, change direction, this will always be here. And so I think that's the thing you got to stay true to, and um, it's what's unique to you, and it's what will create that unique path. So unfortunately, we can't go on for hours. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we're happy to be a part of this. EO's glad to be a part of this with Chris and GDEX. And um, I know Alberta will stay and talk for hours if you want. Um, but thank you guys very much, and uh, appreciate Thanks, it. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.